welcome back to the show. And now it is time for a trio of long-term test reports. A lot of people question the validity of a long-term test bike, but there is method in our madness. Take this, my long term, of the KTM 1290 Super Duke GT. When I first rode it last year, I have to be honest, I really didn't like it. It was harsh and brash and really unrefined, and it didn't really seem to know what it wanted to be. And when I climbed off the bike, I was just as confused as the bike seemed to be. And that bothered me. Was it really that bad? Or had I just got it really wrong? And therein lies the beauty of the long-term test bike. Normally we get a bike for a couple of days and that is simply not long enough to form any meaningful judgment about it. But live with a bike on a day-to-day -day basis and it reveals more to you. It starts to make more sense. In the first month of ownership, this KTM Super Duke GT has shown me abilities and capabilities that I just never realized were there when I first rode the bike for two very short days. And that's a real shame because I was missing out the whole point of this bike. And now I absolutely love it. Some motorcycles have no one particular standout feature. I'm not saying that as a bad thing. They're good in all departments, but with no one element that defines the bike. But then there are the bikes that have one element that just shouts at you. And the element that does all the shouting on this bike is the engine. Normally, when a manufacturer takes a bike and modifies it into a different role, they play around with the settings, often to cries from customers of, why? Either they soften the suspension or detune the engine or some other pointless exercise. KTM hasn't done that. This is the same insane motorcycle that the 1290 Super Duke R is, but with a lot more practicality added. The chassis remains sharp and dynamic. The engine is rough and brash, but you can forgive it everything because, like an English football fan, it's always up for a good fight. The performance is enormous. It's unbelievably quick. It's not the engine you'd expect in a practical bike, and because of that, it's brilliant. This is a touring bike that has sharp teeth. Comfort is a whole lot better than you would think, looking at that thin seat cushion. The riding position is sporty, but on the right side of comfort for long days in the saddle. Wind protection is good without being spectacular, but at least there's no buffeting. The 1290 GT is not perfect. What bike is? But I don't want to dwell on that at the moment. Because for now, I just need you to understand how good this bike really is. It's different, but it's very good. So anyway, that's Harry's long-term test, and now on to mine. If you remember from a previous episode, I was given this. It's the Indian Scout 60. Now, for all the people that have stopped me in the street and said, what's an Indian? Is it made in India? No. In fact, Indian is probably one of the most iconic names in motorcycles in America. If anything, it's probably pronounced Indian. Now, the Scout 60 is the smaller, more simpler version of the Scout range. It's a 60 stands for 60 cubic inches, 999 cc's, slightly smaller, slightly less powerful, but quite frankly, that's not a problem because, and I'm glad Harry said that when you ride a bike more often or for longer periods, it sort of changes, your, your views on it sort of changes. And that's true because when I first rode this, I thought it was funky, I thought it was cool, and I still think that, but I also now think something happens to you when you ride it. You kind of relax. This, this motor is so smooth. The seating position is so easy going. The, the classic looks of it, everything just does something to you. It's impossible to ride this bike while feeling angry, stressed, anxious, anything like that. It all just flows away. As a matter of fact, this is a giant motorized two-wheeled chill pull. You just chilled when you ride it. And the word keeps coming to mind while I'm riding it, not about the bike, but about things happening while I'm riding. And that word is meh, M-E-H. Now you might have heard your 13 year old daughter say that a few times. For example, when you interrupt her texting to ask her if she studied for that massively important exam tomorrow, she might say to you, meh. 
And it, really you do. For example, I'll give you some examples now. If cars do not leave you enough space, meh. Running out of petrol because you foolishly ignored the fuel light, meh. Having a car pull out in front of you, meh. Having to polish those chrome exhausts. I kind of wish I'd let these cool down a bit though, meh. And finally, getting mugged by an armed maniac, meh. And quite frankly, all of this is annoying me. I've always been somebody who loves speed, who loves getting places quickly, who's been impatient, who loses their tempo on the road. I've nurtured these feelings throughout my whole life. And now suddenly, meh. <sighs> Whatever. I think that means that he likes it. I know I'm a fan of the Indian Scout, but I'm much more of a fan of my own long-termer, which is this, BMW's S1000XR. Now, before I started living with it on a permanent basis, I'd actually ridden this bike on three previous occasions. And it's those rides which had made me such a fan of the bike. The first time was in Germany and Austria. I was riding to the BMW Motorrad Festival. The second time I got on the bike, that was down in KwaZulu-Natal on the South African BMW launch of the new model. But remember, underneath the Bagley Adventure styling is the same engineering that gave us the naked S1000R and the double R Superbike. The XR might be the third S model, but I have to say, I reckon it's the best yet. And finally, I spent a lot of quality time with the XR on a long distance cruise down to Port Elizabeth. As you can see then, I've never failed to be completely impressed by the XR on whatever journey I've undertaken on it. But, what about you? What about the guys who actually spent some money on this model? What do you think about it? Well, I asked that question a couple of weeks ago on the show and I've had plenty of replies. Lots and lots of replies, far too many to get through here, but I am gonna take one or two quotes that kind of sum up what you guys feel about it. I'm gonna start with a bloke called Trevor who apparently doesn't have a surname. And he said that he'd recently traded in his BMW R1200R for the XR and he absolutely loves it. Uh, he thinks it's kick-ass good in all respects, except maybe the fuel consumption. Yeah, I think you could have guessed that one, to be honest, Trevor. Okay, let's take a look down this list of names, though, and you begin to notice and realise that just like every bike, it does have its irritations. So what are the irritations for the average XR owner? I know what mine are. They're vibrations. They tend to start around 6,000 RPM, for a couple of thousand RPM, and then they sort of disappear again. You do get them through the handlebars, but for me, I notice them most through the foot pegs. Now, they're not, they're noticeable, they're not massively irritating. In normal riding, on a country road, or if you're, if you're in traffic in town, you know, it's accelerate, brake, accelerate, brake, you never hold a constant speed. You do notice it on the motorway, though. So, being the ingenious viewers that you are, some of you have made a plan, in particular, Basil Baum, or Baum, sorry, I've massacred your name, but uh, he got one in August of 2016. He noticed the, uh, the vibration on the test drive, but he loved everything about the bike so much. He bought it, and then he really noticed the uh, vibrations and he nearly sold it again. But working in concert with his BMW dealer, he managed to fit some rubber spaces to the bars, and he says that's not cured the problem, but it's made it much more livable with. And what I like here, apart from Basil Baum, Graham Thomas, this bloke's an engineer, so it makes sense. He actually noticed by searching on the interweb that uh, vibration's an issue for a lot of riders. Heavier bar end weights can make a difference. Standard ones are about 75 grams. He had some made up by an engineering mate, 320 grams, stuck them on there, barely noticeable, just about completely solved the problem. So what am I gonna do? Exactly that. And actually, because the XR itself, I think the vibes are made a little bit worse because it's, it's slightly short geared. It does rev a bit high when you're on the motorway cruising. So I reckon I'm gonna lengthen the gearing just a little bit. Maybe that'll help the vibration issue. Maybe it'll help the fuel consumption issue. It'll definitely help the buzzy nature on the motorway. Yeah, I think it could be a good thing, but the only downside is possibly it will kind of dull just a little bit that eagerness of the bike. So only one way to find out, and that's to experiment. Well, that's all we've got time for on the soap opera that is the bike show. And uh, we will be back, of course, next week with more new bikes, more new products, more news, and the extraordinary sight of Donovan Fury on his hands and knees scrubbing the office floor.